Now, if you're like us, you think, or should I say no, that submachine guns are pretty much the coolest guns ever made. So, we had Ryan Buckenhern on to talk all about the history of submachine guns, some of the really old runs from back in the day, and all the way up through some of the modern ones that we see on the market today, and also some of the adaptations of pistols and other things like that into SMGs or small, little, tiny, handy rifles, oftentimes shooting pistol calibers. So check this one out, and as usual, let us know what you think in the comments below. All right, I almost can't contain my excitement here. If you've clicked on this episode already, you know what we're going to discuss because it's in the title somewhere. Submachine guns, SMGs. Mark is to my left. The uh, not notorious, not infamous. What's the, uh, honorable. what's the honorable, the nice version of notorious and infamous? Ryan Muckenhern across the table. Um, all of us, uh, all of us still here and whatnot. This is this has been this has been the uh, the trio as of late. The ones the ones that are here and the ones that are able to uh, to record episodes. The so. Trinity. The Trinity. <laughs> <laughs> um, a favorite topic of yours, Ryan. Mark, a, a budding favorite topic of yours. I'm there, hoping. There, it's quite quite interesting. There's lots of them. There's oh, lots man. of them. Um, I th- you can't you can't discuss subguns and just start jumping into types of them and whatnot without first first acknowledging the the purpose for mm-hmm. their existence mm-hmm. because the reason subguns are a thing is just cool in and of itself right i mean ryan you can explain it better than i but we went from a time i mean subguns started becoming a thing in in really kind of like the world war 1 era maybe even sooner yep. but we came from a time where people were using big old gigantic muskets grandes bolt guns yep. and stuff like that and now wars were being fought in trenches. Or they're being fought in, especially World War II, you started having wars fought in cities and towns and things like that. Um, even, even, um, even I was reading some stuff on the Winter War between Finland and the Soviet Union. Oh, yes. And that wasn't even necessarily that they were doing super close quarter stuff, even though they were, they were actually just trying to pump guns out to outfit their citizens yep. and military at as fast a rate as they possibly could and yeah. these sub guns were really easy relatively to manufacture yeah. um super wild stuff so so going to that you you know guns ryan incredibly well so what's what's like what's your first sub guns coming on scene who was doing it why were they doing it uh the Finns, the germans um those would would I mean in the in the Nordic nations, if you will, in Europe, that's where a lot of these started coming out. Um, pistol calibers, uh, more than rifle calibers, and then adaptations of rifles to pistol calibers. Right. Uh, and one thing we here at Vortex, we have a hunter sight in uh, every fall. We have folks come from around the area and they come get their rifles up and running. And and um, one of the the neat pieces of history that we've seen here is I had a gentleman come in with a 1903 Springfield that had been cut very specifically for an adaptation for trench warfare in the Springfield called the Peterson device or Pedersen device, I guess semantics, maybe Pedersen, Peterson, um, adapted the 1903 Springfield, which is a bolt rifle to fire a pistol caliber semi-auto. What? Yeah. Very clever device. How did you... Did the receiver stay? Did the barrel stay? So everything's what? the same. What? Yep. I can't even picture it. So you pull the bolt out of the 1903. And it's originally shooting 30 out 6 Yep, correct. Thir- okay. And inserted into the raceway where the bolt went is more or less, we'll call it a pistol slide for um, intensive purposes. Okay. Okay. Um, and then used a, uh, a a stick magazine like you would find on a, on a pistol to put in there. The okay. idea was um, in trench warfare... If we're if we're hopping over a trench or running through it, manipulating a bolt rifle in too, high caliber too is too long difficult. Um, so we we had trench shotguns that were a, a big talking point, and then we also had the Peterson device, um, which was the, some fable and some lore behind it, uh, but a really interesting adaptation. What pistol caliber was it shooting? It was kind of its own critter, um, and, it, and it it went through the same barrel. Yep, thirty caliber. I was gonna say it had to be some sort yep. of thirty cal. Yep. And there have been similar adaptations made for 32 ACP, which actually had a, a you know a bullet diameter of 30 caliber, even though it was stamped as 30. 
Um, so they even made these neat little cartridge adapters that you could put in that would fire a 32 ACP out of a 30 out six case. Um, and so there's there's been there's a couple wild things that have come out of that era, uh, and it was it was an interesting time in firearms development because you know here Maxim had made the machine gun, and there had been a couple of other iterations of machine guns at that point in time, and then that had become a global uh, product. You know there had been uh, Maxim machine guns chambered in. Uh, 7.62 by 5.4R, the Russian cartridge that the mm. Russians were using. And there were Maxim machine guns and 8-millimeter Mauser that the, the Germans were using. And, and then, you know, certain um, Scandinavian and Nordic chamberings. And then, of course, on the U.S. side. Well, the necessity for a man-portable device, so we developed the submachine gun, um, a tiny version that we could carry around, more often than not firing pistol calibers. Yeah. Yep. High rates of fire... Uh, were, were the common theme, something we could put a ton of firepower downrange uh, in a very short amount of time. Um, yeah. You know what I love about subguns so much is that when you look back in history at the major battle rifles, like the main battle rifles, yep. you see, first off, they all kind of generally look the same. As you go up, even even going back into World War One era and stuff like that, you yeah. go into World War Two, and eventually you got you know the M1 Garand, which still yep. kind of looked like you know if you just nixed the fact that right back near the receiver there wasn't a bolt, right? It was still a Woodstock rifle, real long, yeah. big. Even then, you get to the M14; it mm-hmm. looks very similar still. Some people even mistake the M14 for being kind of like an M1 Garand chambered in 308. And then finally you go to the M16, but now the M16 doesn't look that much different from the M4, and now the MK18s and stuff like that that come out of it, they're all just variants mm-hmm. of, you know, essentially the original, the M4 and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And, I mean, I'm not saying that you should just make guns look cool just for the sake of looking cool. They're very utilitarian. Yeah. But the thing that's so awesome, as a, as a firearms enthusiast, strictly... And and somebody who's interested in mechanical things and how they work and how things are made, you look back at subguns and it was anything goes. Yeah, Dude, it, it was is. Make it small. Make it shoot a pistol caliber. Make it shoot full auto, and and just like do it in any means necessary. Yes, it is the. I'm looking at all these different versions here. It is the wild west of design. Where you, did you find this list, by the way? That you're this, this is list from, is super cool because it just has like a. It's a straight up just picture excel sheet looks like guns of the world almost it It, does well it's kind of what it is i think it's from uh, the wikipedia but it seems to be somewhat comprehensive you know grain of salt probably some of this information but uh stick meg load it from insert from the bottom insert from From the top the the side you you want a drum meg on the bottom yeah let's put it on the top on this one yeah on the side on front oh let's take the pistols that we already shoot i saw the german lugers that they had with like a drum mag sticking out the bottom and a weird wood stock bolted to it that you could remove i swear this uh this uh glazenti that we were talking about earlier it looks like uh hey if one's good let's have two i mean what's what's going on here jim oh the aircraft mount oh yeah, yeah 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 That's more of a machine gun than... Right. But then just below it, though, you have the Beretta, which is the M1918. That is a cool gun. I never realized Beretta made so many submachine guns. It made that, everything. That, I was, that, that was one of the things that I was really... Because I know you've got H&K. You've got the Germans back in the day who were, who were making the MPs. Which, was that H&K? Who was making uh, no. No? No. That was kind of anybody who could fund the war machine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I guess I didn't. But you've got... Uh, I don't know. You have some of these ones that you now know as... I did a terrible job of making a list because I only listed <laughs> one. Um, <laughs> but but I never I never would have pegged Beretta in there. Even now they have like the PX whatever Storm. Yeah. Yep. But I kind of forget about that one, admittedly. I'm like, but... It's modern. And subguns kind of faded. Uh, I'm not going to say faded from obscurity, I guess, because they're still spectacularly popular. But... Um, you know, I think in American gun culture, the subgun kind of took a back seat and it went to the carbine. Which, yeah. Which, you know, I don't know. How, I still, I still have a soft spot for subguns, but a lot of people kind of question their, I don't know, their utilitarian use. Yeah. Um, as they're like, ah, I still shot a pistol cartridge, and so oh, well, I have my sidearm, but then I have my carbine. Um, and so they kind of faded into obscurity. But recently, in the past several years, they've really gone up 
uh, you know, in popularity. Are you talking I think about old ones that have gone up in popularity or new, new ones? That new subguns. On yeah, okay. new subguns. Can think I ask a question? Yeah. So we got, you know, subguns, SMGs. Yeah. And then nowadays we talk a fair amount about uh, pistol caliber carbines. Yeah. yeah. PCCs. Yeah. Right. What's the main difference? Well, there's is, also the is, is PDW. It full auto versus yeah. Not? I mean, like a true submachine gun would be a fully automatic, right. you know, firearm chambered in probably a pistol caliber. And then there's the PDW, which is like yeah. supposedly different. Which is, well, I guess, we'll call it a concept more than anything. Yeah. Um, part of this is, you know, you're looking at this exhaustive list of various SMGs from, you know, mostly European countries here. Well, they were machine guns. Well, we all know in the 30s, machine guns became outlawed in the U.S. You couldn't have them. Um, so part of that is the reason why they never sure. gleaned any popularity. Whereas right. Milserp rifles, whether they be M1As or, or excuse me, M4, well, not M14s because they were full auto, but we'll call M1 Grants, M1 Carbines, Mausers, you know, whatever you have, you could get those as a civilian in the United States. So certainly their popularity is going to go up. Right. Um, there were not a lot of, you know, semi-automatic versions of the Swami submachine gun that were brought, you know, to light. So oh, they wow. kind of they kind of faded away. Um but it, it isn't without, or it shouldn't be without noting them because they were extremely important mm-hmm. uh, in in like, the winning of war, I guess. Um, and and there's a couple that have stuck around and are are still very popular today. And and you know you, you guys have talked about video games on on the podcast in the past, but um, you know you, you you look at some of those some of the the common players that come back up are like the Thompson submachine gun. Oh, iconic. Yeah, the MP38. Um, the UN, UPA, yeah the PPSH from UNP Russia forty five yep that's a little bit newer one than the ones you were just listening yep. or listing but but like a lot of these had a huge hold on on warfare back in the in the forties and and even into the fifties and sixties as we entered you know other other conflicts uh, my grandfather in fact had an M three A one grease gun that was given to him when he was in Korea he didn't know what it was he years later would describe it to me he's like I don't know it was really it was kind of heavy and I think it shot forty five and and uh, it looked like a I don't know it looked like a grease gun I said well grandpa that wasn't an M three A one grease gun no that's not that is it no no no. That's a that's a different critter. There should be an M three A one on that list though. Uh, iconic American sub gun. It doesn't look all that dissimilar from that gun that you're just showing. In fact, I think is that the German copy of the Sten machine gun yep. that he just held up? I don't remember what they called that. They're calling it here the MP three zero zero eight. Yeah. That's okay, yeah. That one was the one that the Germans they re- eventually towards the end of World War II started copying the British Sten, mm-hmm. which I mean, so again, going into the stories behind all these. So you have you brought up the Tommy gun. Yep, that was developed or at least began. I know development in World War One, actually, mm-hmm. right, or close to somewhere in that Tailing, cir- yep. circa. Um, the Tommy gun was a cool gun. It was a fantastic submachine gun, heavy as heck, yes. and it was um, decently, I guess, should I say, relatively complicated to make. Yeah, I don't want to act like it was like the most complicated thing ever, but. When we got into World War II and we were like, hey, we got to start pumping guns out, the Tommy gun, they couldn't build them as quick as they could yep. the grease gun. Yep. So we kind of switched to yep. the grease gun. We went from a, a milled receiver on a Thompson, even the the liquidated version of the Thompson, um, to a stamped receiver on the grease gun. Right. So they could turn those things out gotcha. like this. And that's the, that's the um, pattern you see on a lot of these yeah. SMGs, stamped parts. Yep, correct. And... and they wanted to try and have a firearm that could be made out of as many stamped parts mm-hmm. as they could. Mm-hmm. So that way you could, like you said, crank them out. It wasn't that hard to make. You make a die, whatever, and then you just bring metal in and just... Psh, 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 yep, start cranking them. them. Whether you were making um, pots and pans, you know, at a factory or a facility that was making cookware, could be retooled to make an MP38. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, or, or in the case of the U.S., a, a, a M three A one grease gun, mm-hmm. um, or in case in case of the British, the, the um, Sterlings and the the Stens and things like that. You know, high volume cooking. Yeah, I guess to feed that war machine. It's interesting. When, like everything, everything about these is high volume from the rate of fire. Yeah. To Mag- how you're trying to make them. Yeah. Make it's. Uh, you really get an appreciation too for how a firearm actually functions mm-hmm. because they boil it all down to just getting the functional things to work. And a lot of times you can kind of see it visually too. It's not all encased in a nice receiver that's all covered up and everything. Yep. 
they have, you know, a firing pin's got to hit a primer, which has to be, you know, connected to a case and a bullet or whatever that has to have a barrel, something at least to shoot it out the front. And that pretty and, much sums up the parts list. That's about <laughs> it. And the, in the magazine, it doesn't matter what side it comes yep. in. You know, I mean, you look at the old Stens, how cool is that? The magazine stuck right out the yeah. side. And why do, they, why do they do stuff like that? Is that just to make the extraction of it going out the other side when the case shoots I, out I imagine that and, and just when they were looking at the sum of parts and how to put everything together and make it feed, function, and fold. It just, right. it, that's, that's the way we're doing it. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, whether it offered an inherent advantage, I, I think is questionable because you look at the, you know, the MP series guns from the Germans, they fed from the bottom for the right. most part. Um, you know, and I think it was just kind of like, hey, this is what we've got. And here's how we're going to do it. And possibly just a way to even manipulate and hold the firearm mm-hmm. during the course of fire. Sure Maybe enough. they thought it was advantageous to do so that way. Because um, they're also giving a lot of these guns to people who, probably got minimal training minimal training yeah like well you probably look at maybe even just the uh you know the fact that they're pistol calibers mm -hmm. right like easy less recoil easier to hold so you could probably shoot it maybe a variety of different ways Mm -hmm. maybe compared to like a a standard center fire you know long gun or something like that these things actually had less recoil um i mean were they heavy enough that maybe they were, I mean, I guess I'd say compared to like a thirty out six. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. so if if you were to take a, you know, a, a Lee Enfield rifle, a bolt gun, you know, chambered in three hundred three, or a, a Sten in nine, you know, the, the Sten's going to be a little bit nicer to shoot. But you turn up the cyclic rate of them, you got to hold on to them because they're going to go <laughs> all right. over the place. And they weren't really that heavy, um, and, and at that time they didn't have any recoil suppression devices like muzzle brakes on them. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's cool though when you look at a lot of them. We we talk about barrel shrouds and we talk about foregrips and we talk about all these things. Many of them didn't have that. You held on to your magazine or you held on to a uh, some sort of cooling shroud around the barrel, and, it, and the precedence was not accuracy. The precedence was volume of fire yeah. in close quarters. Yep. And again, like you had mentioned early, Jim, you know, trench warfare and or urban warfare where we're moving in and out of buildings or tight European city streets. Mm-hmm. The thing was purpose-built to do battle there. Right. Uh, and, and then also... Like, or your big, unwieldy bolt-action rifle, or your big, unwieldy... Yeah. Even an M1 Grand. I mean, it's not Huge. that easy to swing in a door. Nine-and-a-half-pound rifle, you know? Gigantic. And it's long. It's a full-size gun. And that was another thing, too. If you think about troop movement, we're trying to move a bunch of people across the world. But we have to take into consideration their loadout, too, mm-hmm. you know? And especially if they're jumping... Into an area, sure. You know, yeah, a lot of guys parachuted in yep. with stuff like this. Yep. Anytime you see like the uh, paratrooper guns yep. too, you know, they have yep. usually like a wire stock that yep. folds under to make it a little bit more compact. Yep. All part of the uh, the mechanism for success, I guess. And actually, we talk about the M1 carbine. I think it could get a note not only as a carbine, but also as a quasi submachine gun too, because there was a variant called the M2 carbine that had a selector switch on it that then fired full auto. Mm. So, mm. yeah, pretty neat there. Uh, no, it was that like, how did that slip under the radar that not enough people talk about that? I, you know, I think it was kind of its introduction and use in warfare, and, and it wasn't it wasn't the initial. Uh, yeah. It was kind of an afterthought, kind of like the Peterson device. Um, yeah, so that's a that's a cool thing too. But yeah, sub guns are neat. They were purpose built, and they're and they're so like the thing with sub guns is you really see people's genius under duress come yep. out because genius under duress. I, I like mean, this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when I think about, I love watching racing and stories about racing cars, right? Because you'll see, you look at the old when Ford versus Ferrari came out, yep. you know, and you see stuff when something's broken on the car, but we got a bunch more laps to go. So we're going to duct tape this and we're going to weld now, probably not welding something in the middle, but you know, we're going to do whatever. We're going to bolt that together, hope that holds, you know, and then all of a sudden you just send it out. And that takes a lot of, you have to understand how this stuff works in order to, when things are happening and chaos is going on, be able to jerry rig something to work up that, you know, can hopefully hold you through. Right. They just, just, it's just something to just get you by. Yep. Right. It's like they pre broke all these guns in the first place so that it was like the bare minimum threshold of mechanical aptitude to hold together under that duress. Yeah. Right. So it's stripped down to its, its most basic components. And some of these on the list, when you look at them, they're like, okay, they made that in their garage. 
Um, oh, hundred percent. Yeah, like that is a car muffler. Yeah, that- <laughs> and and hey, and and you know what? A lot of a lot of those things did come out of factories that made car mufflers mm-hmm. or made auto parts or made anything. That- sure, well, I'm sure. And they were probably even if they could robbing from the parts bin. Like yep. if you could make a gun from just stuff you got at the hardware store, why make a bunch of new tools and dies and yep. stuff? Just make it from parts from the hardware store. And and a lot of those did not necessarily stand the test of time. Then we didn't see them go on to be a primary military issued arm you know they were like uh hey this saw some brief use in this conflict and then was eventually replaced by this refined version but got the job done right um you know the grease gun's a good example came in uh in the american involvement in in world war ii and then lasted up until about vietnam and it was a pretty scarce option my gunsmith actually got an m1 or m3a1 grease gun um in Vietnam as kind of a, an interesting story. He had to turn his gun in seven days before he left country. And as he, <laughs> as he was leaving the place where he had to turn his gun and they had an M3 one grease gun for him under the seat of his Jeep. Uh, so it was, <laughs> they were still rolling around out there. Um, but I think after that, they kind of faded into obscurity and then we did have sub guns that took yeah. the place. And at that point in time, the MP5 had come, come onto the scene and became kind of a, an issued arm. Um, but, I think all subgun adventures in modern day are, to quote Adam Maxwell, uh, for more clandestine use. Mm-hmm. And we see them in, in the hands of uh, some very interesting men and women that um, operate on various continents for various reasons. Right. Uh, none of them, unfortunately, are like these cool things. Maybe I know. They're also, each one of these has its own unique character. Uh, the one thing I will say is, Mark, I know we've, we've, even, we've mentioned it briefly once in a previous 10-minute talk. I know you and I suffer from some uh, hand issues where our hands oh. uh, frequently crack open and, and bleed randomly. Um, and uh, it's not just <laughs> dry skin, as many people like to point out. But knowing how much pain it is to have your hands constantly cut open, and then when I look at old guns like this, and I think it to myself... Every edge on those things is sharp. Yep. Everything, I'm sure, just like sticking the mag in, whatever, wherever you put your hand, you know, whether it's on a cooling device, which probably doesn't stay cool for long, no. or whether your hand is on a magazine as it's probably, you know, jiggling around in the mag. Well, I'm sure these guys just must have had bloody Oh, hands yes. I mean, stamped. Things. There is nothing, no polymer furniture. There, is, Everything is stamped sharp metal. Yep. Not a lot of uh, refinement. Here, no, like no. like we talked about. I mean, this is the old uh, the the parameters. Mickey go bang lots. Yeah, Mickey small. Yeah, the uh, one story that I was reading that I thought was super neat was in that winter war I was talking about, Finland versus mm-hmm. uh, Soviet Union. There are stories of Finnish ski troops using the Swomi. Um, I can't remember the letter and number designation. They're using the Swomi uh, submachine gun. And they would ski up on a column of Russian troops and just lay waste via their fully automatic Swomi mm-hmm. submachine guns to this giant column and then just ski off back into the forest on the other side of the road. Yep. And they were just, you know, doing that kind of thing. And they had to because they're far outnumbered, this relatively smaller country in yeah. comparison. Well, then, of course, Russia, it's funny, you know, then they go and they make their PPSH or something yeah. like that. Which is one of the coolest subguns ever it's produced. Super cool, and then they just outfit their like entire army with it. Yeah, I mean, it, and they were saying that there were even portions, or maybe even large portions, if not the whole thing, where they were just giving those out. Yeah, like you would. That was all you got. Yeah, you just got a submachine gun. Yep, and the, those were shooting the um, Tokarev. Yep, seven six two by twenty five. At an astounding rate of fire. When you is when, that what makes those things mostly cool? Is just how fast they shoot. Yeah, and and they were a pretty ferocious gun too. Yeah, um, you know, it's a really neat cartridge, very high velocity, um, anti, um, I, I guess anti characteristic of a pistol caliber. When you really look at it, they do zip, and uh, you know they had pistols chambered in that, they had submachine guns chambered in that, and that was a a very very clever piece of. Hmm. Uh, war machinery, uh, the PPSH. Uh, and when you do light one up, they just sing. They fly through. They had big drum mags or stick mags, and they just zip through rounds like crazy. This guy, Ryan? Uh, yep, PPSH 41 right there. That yep. thing is so cool. Again, what do you hold on to? Uh, the drum. 
Okay. <laughs> Probably. Like or, or, or the shroud. It. Yeah, or the shroud. So this is a cooling shroud around a very thin barrel. That's got to get hot. Oh, That's yeah, still, right? undoubtedly. Especially when you're zipping through that many rounds. Correct. Yeah, the drum goes pretty quick at that point in time. But, uh, you know, it's interesting you mentioned um, the the Winter War. So the uh, famous sniper of the Winter War, Simo Hayek, um, you know, we talk about his prowess with a rifle. He actually used a submachine gun as much, if not more, some accounts say, than he did a sniper rifle. Interesting. At the time, huh. uh, to you know, make phenomenal shots on everything from people to aircraft mm-hmm. uh, during that time. So wild, yeah, pretty pretty crazy stuff. Um, I enjoyed what you were saying too, because you look around the world and back in that time, pretty much every country had its own mm-hmm. submachine gun, uh, which is which is yet another neat thing because now you know you got nato and and we've we've done 10 minute talks on you know those cartridges mm-hmm. if they haven't come out yet that's just stay tuned uh at the time of this release but anyways um you know a lot of stuff starts looking the same mm-hmm. you know and it starts being able to oh well you know it takes ar butt stocks and stuff like that and next thing you know they all kind of look the same mm-hmm. but every country had its own unique looking smg mm-hmm. And the Australian one, the Owen gun, which was I, your comment of it looks like if you told a bunch of people who had never seen a gun before to make a machine gun. That's how that gun <laughs> looks. <laughs> let's stick a pistol grip here, and then let's just stick another pistol grip up there, and then you know we'll. Uh, it's it's like a Tommy gun, and a Sten had a weird, you know, very child. weird child. Which one is that now? Uh, right. You're gonna have to mark. It's it, not I this think guy here. This has is been it? no. This has been your demise. Is that you printed out this amazing uh, list? But it's, oh, it's, dude, it's, I'm I can't get out of it. It's uh, you, you will know it when you see it. The least you will know it. Well, it is one of the ugliest things that I've ever seen. But in its own unique, um, the one you word. were just talking about. I found one from Australia. It had two. Just not it, but now. Anyway, doesn't matter. Anyway, look, look it up. Along Google now. that. The Owen we'll gun. Google it. Yeah. You, you'll, I don't. You'd be like, wow, that's real? <laughs> um, yeah, like 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 Jim had said, you got on the hardware store. You're like, well, we need a this and a that and a this and a that. And they put them together. That's so the there truth. you go. As time progressed, mm-hmm. we ended up with stuff like the MP5. Mm-hmm. And we ended up with stuff like the Uzi mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. Mac 10. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Stuff like that started coming on scene. What were the advancements that people were making with those guns? I, you, the MP5 is one is an example of just one that's that's to the test of time. Oh, yes. That's still around. Yes, absolutely. Roller, delayed, blowback yep. yep. system. I'm I'm no MP5 savant or or you know, whatever, by any means. I don't even have one, but I do think they're cool. Yes. Um, like, what's happening in those guns that is so much more advanced and refined that they've stood the test of time more than the old guns? Well, I think, like, with the manufacturing of anything, you get to a, a sweet spot, and it's like, this just works. Yeah. And it's serviceable, and it's affordable to produce, and it's ergonomic, and it's um, widely acceptable. And I think that's where the MP5 really came to shine. So if you look at a lot of like HK's patterns, you look at like, um, you know, a G3 uh, or a, a 51 or a 53 or even an MSG90 or a PSG1 and you look at an MP5, they all they all look like they're related to each other, right? Yeah. As they should. Sure. Um, and it was just a really darn good design. And from the 70s on up, had pretty much remained unchanged. I mean, they they'd made some different caliber variants. There was an you know MP5 chambered in 40 and MP5 chambered in 10. You had the UMP, which is similar to an MP5 chambered in 45 ACP. Yeah. So they had something in every flavor um, for you know whatever caliber your loadout might might be doing. And on a lot of that too, you had um, companies that had become mainstays in war machine production and HK was one of them. You know, they, they had outfit the German army and then they had outfit uh, American special forces and they'd outfit allied special forces. And, 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 you know, now HK is a huge, huge manufacturer and player in, in the war game mm-hmm. um, with infantry rifles for the Marine Corps and sniper rifles for the Marine Corps and um, that kind of thing. And, and how they, long I'm, has HK been around? Sorry to interrupt. I don't know. I'd have to, I'd have to look at when their official start was. It's I'm like not, in my earlier terrible list that I tried bringing up of people who made, famous sub guns. I think of HK a lot. Mm-hmm. 
but when you think about, you know, I was talking about Beretta earlier, mm -hmm. or you talk about Springfield mm -hmm. or FN or some of these other companies that have been around since Beretta, would you say 1526? It's insane. Yeah. Amazing. And yep. then you have HK, who's up there. Pretty with new. A, with, yeah. Yep. They're a brand that I think of as being one of those, oh, it's... It's, it's HK, HK. yeah. You know, like you haven't heard of that, uh, right? But I, it's, it's relatively new compared to those. You know, it's like it's like seemingly. Ford. It's like Ford's been on the scene forever, right? Yeah. And Bentley's been on the scene forever, right? Yeah. And Toyota's pretty new, right? Yeah. But they're they're like a mainstay now, right? right. They they did it right. They had a, a really good product, and HK with the MP5 had a really good pro and still does have a really good product, and it's here to stay, right? You know, and, and it's it's one of those Uzis for another. Uh, Talking point to um, Israeli, yeah, Israeli uh, IMI IWI. Um, the Uzi is a, a iconic Hollywood sub gun, mm -hmm. and it's not just Hollywood though. I mean that that's a, a war piece and has been for a long time. The United States Secret Service, you know, had and probably still has Uzis in, you know, in use. Um, they just work and they work well, and they come in a lot of different variations from micro Uzi to standard carbine. Um, so the micro Uzi, if you look up this sub gun, is as I mean, you remember when you were a kid, they had the Mattel um, Uzi, you know, the yeah. little plastic Uzi. It's a thing. It's this super tiny little critter, uh, like this big, enormous cyclic rate, highly controllable, highly compact, concealable. You could stick a 32-round magazine in it, and, and you'd have a functional device. How many so, uh, targets uh, do you think that has actually laid rounds on? A lot of how many? Maybe maybe not of, so of much. How many rounds it's it's sent down? Range. Maybe not so much the micro, but the standard Uzi uh, yeah. has has been a thing for a long time. Same thing with the Max too. The Max, the Max kind of take a second place to an Uzi, but a Mac is a pretty serious design too. Open bolt design, super simplistic. You look at a Mac at how it's produced, it, again stamped. That's one thing that a lot of these sub guns share is they're still stamped. You know, if you've if you've got an, an MP5 and a lot of MP5 variants, they're still stamped. A lot of Uzis are really? still stamped. Yeah, the MP5 doesn't look as stamped as some of the other ones. No, but when you see an Uzi and you see a Mac 10, you see some of the older yep. World War II subguns. You're like, yeah, that's stamped. Right. Um, it's it's clever. I mean, yeah. if you, we've got an MP5 on the wall here, it's a stamp shell. It's a shell, okay. you know, basically you know, the receiver itself, there's a fold at the top. It's then, you know, reinforced and welded and all this stuff and okay, put yeah. the stock on it. Um, they just did it a little bit. They just make it look a little bit more quite refined. A bit, quite a bit more refined, yeah. Um, and, and they've stood the test of time. And same thing with, with Uzis and Max. Max saw military use on, on U.S. Special Forces. They saw, um, you know, CIA and I'm sure, uh, you know, some of those interesting um, alphabet soup agencies had max in various calibers from 380 ACP to 45 ACP. Uh, they were they were very famous for their extraordinary cyclic rate and ability to be suppressed um, That's and a suppressed. Mac Here's a Mac 10. Yeah, and and uh, the ability to be suppressed well. Um, very interesting gun. You can see here this one's got the the folding stock variant. So there's actually a stock on there that that comes out little inexpensive wire stock that comes down. Super minimalist. Yes, so very, cool. But very purpose built, right? And that's the thing with the sub gun. We, we have to go back to. So you have your handgun, um, you know, and and that's all well and good, but handguns require a fair amount more training to be efficient or proficient with than, say, a subgun would because the subgun makes up for it in controllability and volume of fire. Um, so handgun's one thing, subgun's another. We thought, okay, it, it, it has the nice parts about a handgun. It's controllable. It can be suppressed. Um, and then when we put a, a full auto switch on it, it has an extraordinarily high cyclic rate and that controllability is still there. Mm -hmm. um, but it requires potentially less training to become proficient with. Um, here's an interesting variant here. This is a Beretta. Uh, it looks a lot like a Beretta M9, right? Oh yeah, yeah. It's actually a machine pistol, which is a little bit different than with a little uh, with a little tiny yep. hand foregrip thing coming off the trigger guard. Oh there. my gosh, yeah. Yeah. So you you grip this. It had an extended mag. It had a selector switch. There was even an interesting buttstock option that you could click onto it. Um, super high cyclic rate. Uh, pretty uncommon, but pretty specialized thing. So that we should make a distinction between a machine pistol and a submachine gun. Sure. Because they could right. they could be considered different, right? Well, and even some of the original, I guess if you say original sub guns, you look back at some of the pictures of what the Germans were doing with the Luger, and yep. it literally was a taking pistol. the Luger, yep. making it full auto, and bolting a stock on it. Yeah, same, yes. thing, same thing with the C96 Mauser, which is a really interesting gun, too. Um, you know, could, could be 
considered one of the front runners in, in sub gun production was a C96 with the buttstock option. In fact, they had a, a clever thing in which the holster was the stock, which you could put the gun in, draw from the holster. If you needed to, you know, g- gain a little more accuracy, you could take your holster off and clip it on to the back <laughs> end of your C96 broom handle Mauser. And here you had this 30 Luger chambered um, submachine gun slash machine pistol slash carbine um, that had a pretty decent degree of accuracy and a, a pretty formidable round, the 30 Luger, uh, that eventually became the 9 millimeter, um, you know, that we know and love today. Uh, yeah, so very interesting lineage for a lot of these, or, or, or um, I guess, seeds that turned into these very interesting uh, creatures that we have today mm-hmm. that are subguns. The one I got a little bit overzealous about and brought up earlier when we were talking about the more World mm-hmm. War II era ones, but that was the UMP-45. Mm-hmm. Because I'm thinking, when you, you brought up video games, and I'm thinking of sort of my generation's uh, the guns you idolized. Mm-hmm. UMP-45, yep. certainly one of them. Yep. The number of different battle rifles. The Vector, mm-hmm. which we have one in the safe. We do actually. have a, we have we a couple. Have we, have a, we have a we have pistol vectors. version and uh, and the rifle 16-inch yeah. barrel version. And um, the P90, which, yeah, that's that PDW thing yep. where that was, like you said, more of an experiment to see if they could replace the 9 mil and put it in this high rate of fire or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then the MP7. Yep. Which, again, was that PDW thing. Yep. But those those are some of the more modern ones, and that's where you get into more polymers, and you're talking yep. about really unique, modernized designs. Mm-hmm. The UMP forty five has got to be one of the slowest cyclic, cyclic rates of any SMG, right? You could you can if you had a, a very fast trigger finger, you might be able to pace uh, an ump. They're <laughs> they're not super fast. <laughs> They actually they're pretty they're pretty snappy when you shoot them, and maybe that's part of the reason they weren't super popular. They're also pretty expensive to produce, I think, more so than than say a, an MP5 would be. Are they heavy? They're not terrible. Oh. I mean, MP5s are pretty heavy though too. Yeah. You pick up an MP5 SD and you put a, a, a stick mag in it. It's it's a lot of weight. Okay. Yeah, they're they're pretty chunky, uh, but a UMP's heavier, and they do have a fair amount of snap. And and actually, you'd mentioned the Chris Vector. Which is a gun that I think it's a little bit more Hollywood uh, recognition than it does anything else. Um, the Vector was was one of the first 45 sub guns to to really I don't know if I'm going to use the word improve over the UMP, but like take the characteristics of the UMP that people don't like, like recoil, and mitigate it and make it controllable and shootable. They're doing that in kind of a unique way, aren't well, they? Yeah, and also shoot it like. A bazillion rounds per yeah, very high stick rate. Yeah, so we're going from you know upper five hundreds to you know edging on a thousand and more depending yeah. on your load. Uh, yeah, and and yeah, Mark, to your point, major departure from regular in the case of of like an MP five, like a roller delayed blowback action to the vector operating system, which actually recoils down instead right. of back. Mm-hmm. Um, and that helps mitigate that recoil, and they really are a joy to shoot. Like I said, we've got a we've got a couple of uh, vectors here, um, and and you wouldn't think that you're shooting a, a blowback of any kind. It's almost like a reverse bullpup too. Yep, because the trigger okay. and the stock and everything is back near your face, yep. and all of the action stuff is happening up underneath your support hand. Yep, or inside the grip of your support hand. Yeah, yeah, it's very strange, very backwards. Shooting it is. You can you can feel that something different is happening than mm-hmm. a normal rifle because usually when you shoot a rifle you hear all the action stuff kind of going on underneath yep. your cheek. Yep. But that one you feel it all happening sort of underneath that support hand and it's and it's not coming back so much as it's going down. It's it's yeah, it's yeah. very unique. I think they're neat. I think I like it. Takes Glock mags. Yep. I like Can't that too. With that and they look like a space gun. They do. They do. And I think that's a, a cool thing now with modern sub guns too is we've looked at what works, what doesn't work. Um, what's proprietary, what's not proprietary. We could we could probably go so far as to say that MP5 magazines are now considered a Milsert product, and you can get MP5 magazines pretty inexpensively hmm. um, from any number of manufacturers. But in modern subguns, um, and maybe we'll just start calling them PCCs because not a lot of people can afford to buy a, a stamped machine gun um, unless you're you know you've got the proper licensing or your manufacturer or whatever. Um, a lot of these modern 
pistol caliber carbines or sub gun types do take Glock magazines or mm-hmm. Beretta pattern magazines or MP5 pattern magazines. There's a company called Quarter Circle Ten. Um, I've actually got two of their rigs uh, for Glock pattern mags, but they make they make an AR pattern rifle that takes mm-hmm. MP5 magazines. So you get oh, you get okay, the, right. the the you know half not quite half century old technology and magazine uh, for reliable feeding out of an MP5. And if if you're outfitting a police department and you want the controls, you know, synonymous with that of your regular carbines, you you pick up one of these neat rigs, you put your MP5 magazine in there that maybe you already have a hundred of from having, you know, 30 years worth of MP5 use on your SWAT team. And and you've got the benefits of the MP5 and the benefits for the AR all packaged together. You make Mm -hmm. this neat thing. Um, I especially like the Glock pattern, um, magazines on some of these things they also make the like qc10 also makes the glock mag well too yep. right yep and i've got one in nine and 45 i um, made a nine mil ar mm-hmm. with the colt pattern mag because one of the forgotten yep smgs i think you could call it an smg it's a colt smg colt nine millimeter yep. smg which is pretty much an ar sbr looking thing with a stick sticking out the bottom of yep. it instead of the normal banana-ish mag yep. that you would expect. Yep. Cool rig. It um, is a cool gun. I like mine. I do sometimes wish that I had one with different magazine capabilities because the Colt ones aren't as easy or cheap right. to find. Right. And you know, that's a that's a often debated topic, too. It's like, oh, well, if I build one of these or if I buy one of these, which one should I get it in with what magazine pattern? Um, and that's a that's a tough call too. I was talking to Trent and Brittany about that the other day. Were you? Yep, because he's on the hey, fence. Trent. Hey, uh, do you get a CZ? <laughs> do you get one of these cool AR type things that takes a? Oh gosh, uh, that's right. Because CZ has the Scorpion. Yeah. Yep. How did I not even mention that? Yeah. That's another one that's iconic. Like, uh, and we should we should really back here. up. We should really back it's up somewhere in to there, the Mark. original Scorpion. Oh, that little thing. The VZ is pretty... Scorpion. Now but, is that the little one that? Uh, well, hold on. No, I'm I'm gonna screw this up if you explain what's VZ Scorpion. VZ Scorpion. Is. Uh machine pistol, folding stock, pistol caliber again, fired uh you, you know, a, a small cartridge, not nine millimeter. Right. Um and pretty it was it was thirty two ACP is what it was. Um really neat machine pistol built out of necessity, think special forces, think um, you know, highly portable. Uh, high cyclic rate, uh, Eastern block is what you would expect. Pretty neat gun. If you if those did also kind of look like car mufflers too, right? With a little stick mag coming looked, out of it. Kind. Of, well, remember on 007, the clob. Yes, that's what it was. Got it. Okay, yep. now I'm yes. Now yep. I'm following. <laughs> so <laughs> thank the, you. The the old VZ51. Uh, pretty neat critter. Um, old Scorpion versus new Scorpion. The new CZ Scorpion is a little bit different. Yes. Um, but uh, modern subgun by by design standards, uh, it's, you'll notice it's on the last page of Mark's stuff here. Right, I think it, it with goes all the, oldest to newest on his uh, with all the cool stuff. What's that oh. other one there? Hold on, wait, wait, wait. wait uh, I guess wait. that's the last page. Hold on, yeah, you, Unless you printed out a bunch no. of. What's that one there? The Magpul. Oh, the Magpul. The FMG. Thing that, the n- thing that never was. That is really cool. That is a Glock pistol grip with a P90 up top and a. Who knows? A FAMAS in there somewhere? Yeah, here's like, the best part. It folds up, and it looks like a flashlight when it's oh, in its folded state. Oh, now I remember this I think thing. I do remember seeing that. That was a SHOT Show. Uh, if anybody at uh, Magpul Industries is listening, we'd love to see that gun come We would absolutely love yeah. to Just saying. try that out. Yeah, it, uh, it, it folded up. It looked like an interesting flashlight. I remember that thing now. <laughs> yeah, and then it deployed very rapidly, and you put a 30 Gosh, that was mag. cool. Yeah, 2008 is the, is the date listed on there. Now, and, and speaking of having a Glock mm-hmm. uh, pistol grip kind of sticking out of it or what looks mm-hmm. like one, um, now you're seeing a lot of people doing the conversion yeah. kits. I guess if you can call it a conversion kit or it's like an add-on kit where yep. you'll make your Glock into a... Now, I know a lot of people are getting the ones with the pistol braces, so technically it's still a pistol mm-hmm. with this interesting contraption around it and a pistol brace. But you can also make it an SBR. So yeah. And people have done it. So yep. I think I'm safe in saying that people are making these into SBRs. So Absolutely. You lock into an SBR. Absolutely. And they're clamping. It's like a clamshell thing almost yep. around the pistol. Yep. And then using the serrations usually of the slide and the Glock, you'll add like a charging handle to mm-hmm. it and whatnot. And then you can have your same sidearm turn into something with the uh, stability and bracing against your shoulder and everything. And 
ability to have a, a support hand come yep. up and hold it, shoot in the same caliber, use yep. the same magazines as yeah. your sidearm. How yeah. fast does that transition take Seconds. place? Yeah, so I, don't if you think, take, I don't think it's long. I don't think you'd want to do it when there's a bad guy right in front the, of you. But the I device think. Jim's talking about is called a Roni. Yes. And there's a, there's a whole, I think they're on their fourth gen now for the Ronies. Um, but as he described, like imagine, imagine like an AR-15 upper receiver almost. Um, sands lower, but with stock and, and like forend. You take your Glock, you open up this clever little hatch, like full Glock, like out of the holster, set it in. You close the little hatch, <clears throat> the charging handle will will index off of, you know, like the, the back end of the slide. And then at that point, your Glock grip becomes your grip. Your Glock magazine, of course, feeds your Glock upper, which is housed inside of this device. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but but then you gain the advantage of that support hand. Yeah, and, a nifty little pick rail on top, put yep. optics on it. My Tur- goodness. Turns your regular Glock, which you'd have a hard time hitting a on an IPSC target at 100 yards into potentially a 200-yard carbine. Pretty neat. Uh, that sounds handy. They are handy. I've always just thought I've drilled over those for a long time. Yeah. I wanted to do one. Um, but that, that it, there is this, and you got and you got other manufacturers out there nowadays, you know, um, oh, you got the MPX, you got some other stuff like that that's coming out. The, it, people haven't stopped wanting to make a uh, convenient, easy, small, uh, uh, economical platform Mm -hmm. that uses the same, a lot of times now people make a big deal about using the same mags too. I'm sure back in World War II they didn't care. No. You know, Um, but nowadays, you know, use the same mags, use the same ammo, is small and compact like a pistol, but offers you, again, more stability and whatnot. People have been wanting to do that forever and yep. they still do yep absolutely and because there's it, there's absolutely a place for that but i think the thing that gets confusing for me i know is that you can now make a really good and reliable ar-15 mm-hmm. in eight inches yep seven and a half inches yep and then it's really small mm-hmm. and it's using the same ammo as your carbine. Yeah, yep. So this middle ground is muddied somewhat by the fact that I can have all those characteristics with the same mag and cartridge as my carbine or the same mag and cartridge as my handgun. Mm-hmm. And you have to choose mm-hmm. which is best. What are your What are your thoughts on that? Uh, okay, that's a really good question. Um, and I, I, okay. Or is there another option that's better than all of them? Also, a really good question, and often debated. I, I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of the old combat shotgun. I, I get a lot mm. of, I get a lot of people that uh, raise an eyebrow, and they're like, "The what?" And hey, we can shoot birdshot, we can shoot buckshot, we can shoot slugs. But you'll over penetrate into the. Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> I like subguns. I love subguns. Actually, I like the idea of a very portable, low recoiling lightweight, magazine-compliant complement arm to my handgun. I think mm-hmm. it's neat. I think, I think that I can carry more Glock magazines in a, in a in the same size container. Fair enough. Weight. Yep. Yep. I, I mean, you, you got to get into some interesting points of conversation, like what's the intended use? Is this home defense? Is this a range tool? Is this for your vehicle? Why do you need this kind of thing in the first place? You know, what are you doing with it kind of deal. But I like the idea of a companion arm to my sidearm. Um, yeah. And I like that magazine compatibility. And I like the ability to have inexpensive ammo. Not that 5.56 ammo is terribly expensive. Right. But 9 millimeter ammo is less. Right. And, and, it, and a lot of times, if people are making those super short ARs, they start yep. getting calibers like 300 Blackout. Yep. Or um, what are some of the other ones? The 6.8. Six, um, six, yeah, six eight SPC, SPC and, or, and so, yeah, 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 and then you're talking about something that isn't as cheap or easily ac- yep. accessible as five five six. I'll I'll tell you this: if anybody's um, done a like a defensive tactics course and you do shooting from a vehicle, if you shoot an AR fifteen with a seven and a half inch barrel inside of a Ugh. vehicle, oh my gosh, even with your pro on, that. there's a lot of powder volume going off there. There's there's a ton of flame. There's a ton of disruption. It's difficult 
perhaps to um, recover from that if you don't do a lot of shooting and you're not accustomed to that I've big never bang. done that. I can't, yeah. But I, I can actually, picture it, and it sounds horrific. I didn't think about that until you mentioned it. Like, in these confined spaces that these firearms are designed for. Yep. That's the whole point. Exactly. I mean, usually when I shoot it, it's out at a, you know, I've shot it at a range right. or whatever. It's outside, bright, sunny day. You don't notice the gigantic blast of fire in front of you yep. or there's enough atmosphere around you to sort of dissipate it. Yep. So here's my here's my shtick for a, a sub-gun style arm. Same thing we just talked about, uh, confined space like your vehicle. If you wanted something other than your handgun on your, quote, person, uh, a sub-gun or sub-gun style PDW, PCC, whatever you want to call it. Great option. Controllable, compatibility with your sidearm, if that's something you so choose. Um, if not, I still don't think that that's that big of a deal. Um, decent rate of fire, decent, uh, you know, firepower. Nine millimeters, nothing to, you know, scoff at. I think it's a fine round for, for what we're talking about here. Um, but mostly controllable, not as disruptive as right. a seven and a half inch AR. Yeah. Um, well, in t- intended application. Yep. Probably pretty close quarter stuff. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and for home defense, I think they're very, very fantastic. I think that a, a nine millimeter something or another, or a forty-five something or another, or even a forty something or another, in a carbine type application like we're talking about here, is a wonderful choice mm-hmm. um, because it's controllable. It's not spectacularly disruptive to the shooter. Right. Uh, in the event that you have to deploy one without hearing protection on. Um, you know, it's not going to rattle your teeth loose so much as my seven and a half inch AR will. Uh, I think it's great for that. Yeah, now you're making me contemplate the seven six two that I have in for potential planned or unplanned circumstances. I mean, anything is better than a sharp stick, right? Right. <laughs> and but so I think of how seven six two but thirty nine would would come out in the hallway. Loud. Yeah. Noisy. Fireball-y. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my god, I'm hit, I'm bleeding. Oh no, it's just my ear. It's just coming from my ear. Yeah. No, that's and that that's a big uh, that's a big consideration. And you know, if if you're looking at it from um like a tactical standpoint, can you maintain that rate of fire with that much um backlash if you will, uh, coming out in the end of the muzzle and the recoil? Right. Um yeah, it's a great talking point, something to consider. If you've got a a Glock, let's say, and that's your primary carry arm, and, and it takes clock pattern magazines, you might consider a clock type subgun. It's less stuff to mix up and goof up and mm-hmm. uh, that kind of thing. And it's always fun to add a new uh, new arm to the stable to, to enjoy and shoot, and uh, it's a very economical way to go enjoy and shoot. Um, and if you get one that's an AR pattern or similar to, it shares ergonomics with an arm you might already have in your inventory, and uh, it'd be a great way to teach somebody who's not yet comfortable enough to, to get on a, you know, a full caliber carbine of some kind, uh, and, and do this with a, a, a way to ease the pain on your mm-hmm. pocketbook when you're out doing training. Yep. Well, new, new and different is always fun. It's always mm-hmm. interesting, but there's just the more I hear you talk about it, the practicality of yeah. having that, you know, that consistency or whatever cross functionality between platforms. Like, ah, oh, you know, my, my PCC takes Glock megs, my Glock takes Glock megs, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's even almost on like a much smaller scale what we've done with like the military. Like, hey, we want to have this consistency. Yeah. So if yeah. something goes down here, we got the stuff over here that you can't have over there and we're not, you know, short on this. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It seems pretty. It seems pretty tactical and yep. practical. Yep. That's but. one thing I'm interested in and why the military has not adopted that mantra of like, okay, so currently sidearm is the M17. The subgun does not take that same magazine. Interesting. Yeah, that is kind of a... What, what's the current... Is there an issued subgun right now that's like the M whatever? Uh, B&T was just awarded the contest. I was just going to was gonna bring them up because I, I forget. And I'm sure, you know, whenever we do these, it's not to... When we're name dropping and stuff, it's not to mm-hmm. slight anybody whose name we didn't think of. But um, it just goes to show these aren't scripted. I don't know how we could. <laughs> um, but B&T is another manufacturer. <laughs> oh, no, manufacturer. you can't script this. No, you can't script <laughs> B&T is another manufacturer who is now... Taking over the world. When I look at their lineup, it's cool. Yeah. It is un. It's it's the middle school pl- middle schooler playing Call of Duty Modern Warfare in me is is very joyous when yeah. I see their lineup. Yeah, they even have a modern um, well rod. 
Yeah. Veterinarians, pistol. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I, did, I first became yeah, aware of BNT that. with a pistol, at, well, carbine, subgun, machine pistol kind of sort of thing. We'll call it a modernized Uzi type rig called the TP9, um, which was a amazing uh, departure from conventional firearms technology. Rotating barrel, which is something you didn't find in a lot of guns. Brett had a gun called the Cougar that had a rotating barrel. It was very novel. Uh, they, yes. they put it in a machine pistol. Um, you know, neat design, very modern design uh, with like a full polymer shell around it and had a foregrip on it and had a neat little folding butt stock. And, and you put the magazine in the, in the grip like you would a regular pistol, very compact, uh, really cool gun. That, that was one that, that caught my attention many, many, many years ago um, was that pistol. And then they have since added all these various sub guns and carbines to their lineup yeah. um, that are very, very well thought out um, that have the adaptability to take a Glock pattern magazine or these unique pattern magazines so that they have. Okay, so they have their own unique and the ability to use Glock yep. pattern. Okay. Yep, they've got, you can swap the lowers out basically yeah, and you cool. can uh, allow it to accept a, a Glock mag on some of their sub guns. That is both cool and very just smart yep. to do. Yep. Yes. Everybody has a Glock. I'm sorry if you if you don't have we talk about Glock so much it almost sounds like we're sponsored by Glock but it's just like I don't know you know who doesn't have a Glock Trent <laughs> sorry uh, anyway really sorry, Trent no, no he won't do it he makes fun of me every day he's my internet bully he's my cyber bully man he's Trent like, Trent what? perhaps Trent? Trent perhaps listens to more Vortex Nation podcast episodes than anybody we know so. We've addressed him now twice, I think, in the last two yeah. weeks. Just personally. Just you know, he's he's my cyber bull and he doesn't like locks. Um what but does he like CZs? Oh. Trent, if you're uh if you're listening now and you're in your car, I'd consider tipping your nose down for a moment to actually look at the road. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. I actually I think CZs are cool too. They do make fine guns. They do, um, they're just they're very they're fine. And they make a scorpion, which is really cool. Ah, a great that is, cool. It is cool. We have one of those in Lo- the safe. A lot too. of different iterations and variations. Now they've got the little K model, which is as as compact as you can get. They make it with a, a pistol brace version. You can SBR it if you if you want to do the paperwork and wait for it. They've all the way they've got all the way up to Evo Carbine, which is like a full feature, full size rig. They've got everything for everything. They do. Yeah. They're cool. Yeah. Um, Here's a question for you. Wait, were we talking about, did I interrupt something about Glocks? No, we were just talking about neat features. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Here's a question for you. At one point in history, they tried to replace the 9 mil. A couple times. A couple times, yeah. at least. So, okay, I, I knew at least once, but a couple times. Mm-hmm. The PDW thing came around. Yep. We have discussed it. You've got the P90 from FN. You've got the awesome mp7 which i still want a civilian variant of hk if you're listening i know a lot of people have, suge- have requested that but maybe, there's there's maybe really one more maybe this will be the tipping point, maybe this yeah. will be the tipping point maybe just one more but um they've tried to replace the nine mil and they built firearms around it firearms that are still in use yeah and the mp7 is so cool i'm sorry but it's just it's it's like a pistol people wear it on their side like badass dudes go in scary places, wear it on their side, yeah. and they can pull it out and just send a lot of rounds down at one point in time. I, I had it here it, somewhere. I doubt it'll be on here because I no, think... No, there was a... I, I, I think MP7. Wikipedia was, like, very adamant that it's... First of all, you need to look at the... Right here, the PP2000 from our uh, friends over in Russia. Oh, that, yeah, the PP2000. That's another super... <laughs> there's so many. There's so many cool subguns. Here's an MP7. Uh, there it is. There, okay, yep. yeah. So my question for you, Ryan, yeah. will they ever do it? Will they, will they ever come nine? up with something better than the nine that know. actually gets adopted and actually gets put into more stuff than just one cool one off thing that everybody wants? I don't I don't know. I don't think so. Let's look at it this way. The Colt Colt Pattern nineteen eleven, one of the John Moses Browning's finest creations. Nineteen eleven. Yes. And actually before that, like nineteen oh eight, is when when that really met its its Point of refinement adoption in 1911. 45 ACP, uniquely American cartridge, very fantastic firearm and design. Will you ever replace the 1911? I don't think so. But haven't they? Not really. Do, who's yeah, 2011? Not many people, <laughs> 2011, not many people are 
carrying a 1911 they're, in combat. They're anymore. not, but there's there's no there's I don't think you'll ever see it leave the landscape. I have a 1911. I was gifted a 1911 for my graduation from college because that was like the most, it was the coolest thing ever. It was like the most sweet gift that I could have gotten as like a, this great, this like accomplishment, right? Yeah. And I cherish that 1911. Mm-hmm. I love the 1911. So I don't want anybody to mistake me in thinking that, oh, who is this guy? Boot him out of the country. It's not like that. <laughs> but would I carry a 1911? Probably not. Do you have a good reason to not? Yeah, it's Big and it doesn't hold as many rounds as a Glock does that I can conceal more easily with. True. Would it still work though? Yes. Okay. If I if I had to, if my Glock was somehow rendered, you know, whatever unusable, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be like the 1911. I'm going to be like, okay, on to the 1911. I I think the same. I think the same kind of. path of argument or discussion could be applied to the nine millimeter though. Could you make a more effective round? Yeah, possibly. I mean, I'm sure they, they already have. I mean, we, this debate is ongoing with, with gun writers since it's military adoption and police adoption. Well, the nine millimeter versus the 45. Well, what about the 40? Well, what about the 10? What about the 357 Magnum? What about the 357 SIG? But so many people are on the, at the point in history where they say 9 mil ammo is so good now, there's no reason to need the 45. It's bigger, completely. it's heavier, it recoils more, you can get a 9 mil, hold yep. more, and all, that's, all this stuff. Yes. So what I'm one, so, so in some ways I almost look at it as though the 45, does it still exist? Yes. Our 1911's awesome. I don't know why you're trying to peg me I... as though I think the 1911 isn't awesome. I like it. Yes. But has it kind of almost quasi been... Not replaced. Upstaged. I mean, are you just trying to kick the hornet's nest here, Jim, by saying to... that you hate the 1911? I'm... <laughs> like, I mean, uh, are, you, are you like let just the stenographer, being intentionally... Let the stenographer show that Jim said, I hate... <laughs> Listen. <laughs> no. but I like, think what Jim's trying to say. I think the 9 mil will exist forever, in perpetuity. I think yes. 9 millimeter will be in the year 3020, and there will be people on their jet ships going back and forth between Earth and Mars to live on their other civilization, and they'll be concealed carrying a not... I, I don't know what, where I'm going with this. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's the, here. The, the, the nine mil is here to stay. Yeah. But will there be something eventually where people are saying... People are doing the same argument they're doing between the nine and the 45, and everybody's saying, well, it's the year 3020. Sure, the nine mil is bigger and whatever, but the modern ammunition of this new 7.5... I don't know what it's going to be is so good it upstages the nine mil and you can hold more rounds. I mean and I think you, faster I think you have to look at intended use and, and application. Um, I thought the 5.7 by 28 was an exceptional option. Very controllable, uh, excellent terminal ballistics. Um, for those listening that compared to a 22 Winchester Magnum, that was just not the case. Um, We've got another uh, 10 well more than 10 minute talk. you can go back and listen about the FN57 right. I thought that was a great option. I thought FN hit it out of the park with their pistol because it did have a higher capacity, offered in the same size package, yeah, uh, with a higher degree of, of shootability and controllability and, and potential accuracy there. Um, great companion cartridge, their P90. Um, did it replace it? I don't think it even came close. Is I, it just because the 9 is just so it's just entrenched? There. It's just there. Like you can't, yeah. it's like almost like this immovable mass at this point. Yeah. I, I agree. Uh, could it be done? Sure. I mean, with modern... We're propell- talking about doing it with the 5.56? Five, five, six. Six, five Creedmoor, man. Yeah, but even then... You don't think it's going to catch? Replace the 5.56 five, with the 6.5 five Creed. They, I mean, these are things I've it's heard. It's not going to happen. So, I mean, let's go back to HK. Okay, so they've got the MP7. Very, yeah, very 4.6? Yep. Very interesting little case. Extraordinarily hard to find. Does it exist? Doesn't it exist? Um, <laughs> who, who knows? They also had a gun called the G11. You should look. Oh, you should that look thing, that up. We got to do a ten minute talk just on that thing alone. Uh, it basically, shot bullets out of C4. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, they tried. Uh, it didn't make it. Um, I want to shoot underwater. I don't know. Like I don't know what the. <laughs> I don't know That's what, what the. I don't know what the real. Um, I don't know what the real necessity is to replace a nine millimeter. I don't know where its shortcomings are. Well, it's, it it doesn't defeat armor. Okay, well, 
well, we've got other things to do that. If we're fighting armor, there's a different way to do it, okay? Um, well, it doesn't have, you know, a ton of foot-pounds of energy. Well, that's a also often disputed um, requirement, right? Do you need foot-pounds of energy? I don't know. Eh. Well, what doesn't it do well? If you can answer that question, then maybe you can start looking at replacing it. Is there a way to just, like, supercharge the 9 mil? And you yeah. can just be like, oh, it's just more 9 mil. Yeah, it's Everything called, is better. It's called 9 millimeter major. What is what? So the competitive shooters in USPSA and and well mostly just USPSA have figured out how to load the nine millimeter no, regular nine by nineteen to pressures far exceeding what you would buy in the store. And so for people listening to this, don't load your your Glock up with nine millimeter major. Uh, it's not a great idea. Uh, but it, it duplicates like thirty eight super comp velocities. So we're pushing a one hundred and fifteen grain bullet at fifteen hundred feet per second as opposed to. Oh. 1,200 feet per second. Um, and it, it's made to accomplish a, what's called a power factor in USPSA. Uh, it's turning your 9 millimeter into a 357 Magnum, more or less. And it's doing it in the same platform, same size. Um, but then we're upping recoil and we're upping you right. know, the potential for reliability issues. And we're at that point in time, well, let's we'll switch to a regular rifle caliber. So I get what you're saying. Yeah. You're saying the 9 mil is perfect as but, it is. Yeah, but for what its intended uses, you bet. It's like, hey, 22 doesn't offer you much, so they made a 22 mag. Well, how come we're not running around with 22 mags? Uh, Everybody's got a regular good question. Yeah. And then with 22 mag, well, then then came 22 Hornet, and then came 223. But we do use a lot of 223. We do. I feel like the nine and you know 223, five five six. There are these nice. Um, Gap like, fillers. We created all these things around them, mm -hmm. and that's where we settled. Mm -hmm. Like, it's kind of like the best of both worlds. Yeah, or not both worlds, but like... I mean, a while, a while all back... All the compromises came together, and that's where you're at. A mm -hmm. while back, we said 308 was dad. 5.56 five, is like mom. Maybe. I don't know. But then the, like, superstar football player kid is like the 9 mil. Maybe I, something to look is at. That like, wrong? like look and at all. Felt wrong look at saying, so we've like got an exhaustive list of sub guns yes. here in front of us. Completely out of order at this point. Absolutely, it it's a mess. Looking at the the nine millimeter options, nine, nine millimeter, nine millimeter, nine millimeter, nine millimeter, toner in the printer after this one had to print maybe. color. <laughs> had to print color. Um, m m the vast majority of these are nine millimeter. Yes. And for In fact, good, that's one of the nice things about this track. 9 mil, 9, nine by 19, 9 by 19, 9 by 19, not that one. 9 by 19, 9 by 19, nine, yeah. Everything. Because it works. It, it feels, it's, it's the right thing to do for that, that application. I believe you. I don't want to argue with you because you're smarter than I am when it comes to this stuff. But I, just, I also like, remember when we were talking in the 6.5 revolution? Hmm. Does the pendulum swing because people just get bored? They do. Yes, and they, they do get bored. Yep. And I just, for, th this is the this is the part of me that comes out that's just the gun enthusiast, right? So somebody might yep. be like, God, shut up. Like, the 9 mil's fine. The gun enthusiast to me is just like, I just like seeing new calibers come out. I like seeing new guns come out. I like seeing this new stuff that's like they're, fun, they're creative, new. whatever, they innovative. Did, they did get bored because I can remember the novelty. This isn't that long ago, back when I shot competitively. The novelty of a rifle chambered in something other than 223. There was no competitive body that was talking about it. There was no competitive body that was allowing it to compete in. Yeah. Like on a on a we'll call it a national level. Yeah. And then the folks at at the USPSA organization realized that there's a whole subset of shooters that would jump into the sport and start playing the game with a nine millimeter. We now have the Ruger. Uh, Nine millimeter PC. Oh, nine. Yeah. 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 So, which is funny because 20 years ago and right longer than that, they had a rifle chambered in pistol caliber. There was a, a lead balloon in a lot of people's eyes. Oh, was, yeah. Nobody wanted it. It was mostly the same thing. And it died because it was, nobody cared about it. What was the uh, Marlin? From, from what was the Marlin Camp, Camp, Camp Carbine? Yeah. Camp Nine was the Marlin. Okay. Yeah. And that one also kind of fell into yeah. obscurity. And now it's a collector's item. And it's too late for them, unfortunately. They can't just come back out. Well, I mean, maybe it could, sure. But the pendulum did swing. People were like, no, we don't want a nine millimeter carbine. For God's sakes, it's a nine millimeter. 
And now everybody wants a nine Now mil everybody carbon. wants a nine milliliter carbon. What's going to be, okay, so what's going to be next after that? This um, is the, I don't know. So just have fun doing as it. this pendulum has swung, here's what I've seen in my 15 years in the industry. Uh, people saying nine wasn't enough. You had to have a 40. Guys who had 45s were like, nah, you got to have a 45. So all of a sudden, 40 became the black sheep. Right. Nobody wants totally. a 40. I mean, it was the butt of every joke. Yep. Which is interesting because it's actually a good cartridge. Right. Um, it's a little bit snappier, but it, it fills its purpose, right? So that pendulum has swung from nine millimeter being the bastard child. Yes. And, and probably more so, 380 ACP being the bastard's bastard child. Right. To now look at all these neat little compact guns that are out there to nine millimeter coming into favor in defensive handguns. Now, most defensive handguns are nine millimeter. Yes. Do you think 380 is next on the list? To no, have an uprising. No, because it kind of did have an uprising. It had an uprising with some some pistols like the Ruger LCP and yeah. and a very brief um, flash in the pan with with like uh, Smith and Wesson's uh, M and P three eighty and yep and the bodyguard yep and um, you know <laughs> Glock's forty two. What? It's a good movie. <laughs> it was a good movie actually. He had a katana in that movie. <laughs> it was great. Anyway. So, like, it had its kind of brief moment of fame. We've come back to 9mm. And, again, with with respect to rifles, like, I remember when 6.8 SPC came on the scene. Everybody was like, the new thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, that my didn't gosh. Last. Remington chambered the 700 in 6.8 SPC. It died. It made it, like, two years. Poof, gone. Yeah, but now it's, like, kind of weirdly coming back. Sort times. of. Yeah, I mean, yeah. All right. Maybe we'll see carbureted engines come back onto the scene. Okay. All right. Right. So... I think the pendulum swung back to nine millimeter carbines. I don't know that you're going to come up with a ready way to change it um, for a number of different reasons. Uh, there's been a couple of neat attempts. Think about 22 TCM. Do you remember that cartridge? No. It was chambered in a pistol. Uh, Rock Island Armory did it, uh, 2011 style pistol. They made a little bolt gun in it, 22 TCM, kind of a nine millimeter, kind of neck down to 22, right? I think along the same lines as the FN 5.7 7 by 28. Right. Okay. We'll call it an intermediate cartridge. High velocity, same case, same ish case size, neck down. It didn't do it. The Brits tried it with a cartridge called the 22 or 224 BOZ, 10 millimeter neck down to 22. Gosh, that's so British. The right. boss. Right. <laughs> uh, right. Right. <laughs> exactly. Cool gun, though. Um, you know, Knight's Armament kind of did it with a. a, a Carbine a PDW slash sub gun chambered oh, in yeah. six by thirty five TSGW. Yes, I remember were, that. Yeah, it looked cool. Yep, super cool. Didn't make it, mm. but why not? Like, there's no good reason for it. Ballistically, it offered an advantage over the nine millimeter, and portability offered an advantage over the two twenty three. It was smaller, more controllable, lighter recoiling, less disruptive, disruptive to the shooter to shoot. But it didn't do it right. So there's there's literal dump truck loads of nine millimeter out on. But aren't a lot of the ones that you brought up really expensive guns? Well, yeah, but couldn't they have been retrofitted? Maybe. Couldn't they have been redone? I mean, look at some of these items on this list here. We're going to look at an HK. HK re-released the MP5 for civilian use, yes, right? Yes, thank God. Which, which a lot of people had some things to say about the cost. Well, that's really expensive, but everybody's okay with it because it's a 9 millimeter and it's from HK, so that's mm. cool. Um, the The... Uh, SIG MPX, pretty expensive little critter. The Chris Vector, pretty expensive little critter. Um, but chambered in 9mm. I don't know that anything necessarily at this point in time fits the bill better. You win. Fine. I'm not saying I no, win. You I'm win. Just, you I don't win. know what to no, do. No, you're right. You're right. No, you're it's right. cool. You're fine. right. I get you're it. Right. It's fine. We'll you know what, I really, you know what right. I really think is going to happen? 10mm. 10 millimeters is going to make a huge comeback. I'd be down. We're, we're seeing 10 millimeter. Like, Except I got these tiny hands. That's my only problem. No, 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 no. You don't got to worry about that. Everybody's carrying 10s for uh, bear protection. That's the thing. 10 millimeter all of a sudden became if like. If you can dodge a bear, you can dodge a pick. A, a, ten a, mil, no, you can't dodge salter. a 10 millimeter. So actually. 10, 10 millimeter is now like the backcountry bear protection choice. It is. Whether or not it offers anything better than anything else in a pistol is so debated. I, I mean, I don't even know where to begin with this. So you shoot, um, a, you shoot a 44 mag wheel gun, you might get two shots off. You shoot a 10 millimeter auto pistol, you might get a magazine off. Is it ballistically better or equivalent to anything? Eh, 
it's some good questions. Is 10 millimeter better than 40 Smith & Wesson? Depends on whose older personal ballistics laboratory you're running the pressure and velocity tests on. But I think you'll see 10 millimeter come in sub guns and people will be like, that's the answer. I'll get one just to piss you off. I have uh, I have the ability to make it. I've got a quarter circle ten <laughs> right, quarter circle Ryan, ten cut. large frame. Ryan, cut. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay um, let's do as we near. I could make a saw one right now. <laughs> as we near the end of talking about submachine guns and also the future of nine mil and what submachine guns will be chambered in, I think we should all pick our favorite one. Oh. God, I did and that give earlier. A brief, and give a brief reason why. Are we going machine pistols or submachine guns? Uh, anything on these lists here that Mark uh, so kindly printed out. Oh, in, my gosh. In, uh, you can pick any single uh, one. Uh, oh, look at this one. A 9 by 23 millimeter Steyr. Cool cartridge. That is cool. That's the answer. Everybody, Everything's chambered a 9 by 23 Steyr. Do you want to go down that road? There's 9 by 21, <laughs> 9 by 23, 9 by 25. Just keep going up by two. All right. All right. Your choice, Ryan. For a sub gun. If I was going to pick one sub gun. I know mine. It's it's the Kalishnikov 9 mil. Great option. And and what the heck it, it this is by this is Kalishnikov concerned, but it's um Who's making it? Well, Kalashnikov USA has their own. Yes. Uh, Century Arms has one. Yes. Uh, Palme- what was the- Palmetto has one. They do. Yes. What was the original one that everybody was like, it was before any of those guys came out with one, and somebody over in Russia had one, and everybody was like, we need to import it somehow. It was, um, I'm blanking on the name, and I feel like an idiot because of it. Malat? I, maybe it was. I, I don't know. Somebody comment. Nine by nine. Uh, I would take a nine mil AK though, for sure. Can you give me a brief reason as to why that? Because it's an AK. Okay. I love AK. Anything remotely related. I love my VZ two thousand eight. Even though I wish it was you know the real one, but whatever. VZ two thousand eight. I love my Vepper, and I would love me a nine mil AK to go along with those. Marco. I don't know. There's too many. Why'd you ask me that? Like, it wasn't a good choice. I just wanted to know if it's no, a fantastic. It's not, what's I wrong think it's with a great that choice. choice? Look at it. It's I awesome. I want one. I want to order one of the AK-9s. I really do. They're so cool. Yes. All right. What's yours, Mr. Fancy Pants? If I was going to have a sub gun, yes. and I'll tell you, uh, ladies listening, okay, for a Valentine's Day present, consider... For you or for... Th- for, for your significant other, or guys that have gals that are big-time shooters. Best Valentine's Day present on the planet, 1927A1 Thompson. Why? Made famous on the St. Valentine's Day massacre. Uh, okay, that's a little bit of gangster history. Isn't that like a little bit weird to give somebody that for Valentine's Day? I mean, Day? I think it's the best Valentine's Day present I could personally get. Okay. Um, so if I was going to pick a sub gun, it would be either. A- Tell you what, nothing's more romantic than a massacre, Jim. Not in my book. I if I was going to pick a sub gun, I would pick probably an M1A Thompson. All right. Is that just because of? It's, you know. Oh, Mister Nine Mill here getting picking the forty five. No, that's not it. Uh, I think of when I think of um, iconic was- American firearms, and I think of like. The the Thompson was a revered and feared weapon on uh, the battlefield of World War II, and I and at the home front, at, right, correct, <laughs> and, yeah, and it because it worked and it did so very well, and it, it I mean it was the Churchill was gifted a Thompson submachine gun, That's and cool. and he thought it was it was to America as the bald eagle was was the Thompson, all right, and I think of Saving Private Ryan. And um, uh, Tom Hanks's character carried a Thompson, and that was a big thing. That 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 was a big deal. I I just remember seeing that as a kid and thinking like that is the gun. I've also fired a number of legit Thompson submachine guns, and they are a masterpiece. Um, they are a singer sewing machine. The sound mm. they make 
yes. is unmistakable. As unmistakable as hearing an M1 Grand finish out yep. its clip. M block comes flying up. I, I think for me, I, I'd I'd pick a either a 27 or an M1A Thompson. Yeah. Did I say that right? Is it a clip then? It's an M block. Yeah. An M. I guess it could be a clip. No, don't. No, I probably screwed it up. We'll call it an M block. All right. When the end block comes out. Yep. Uh, it's it, it, the sound that Thompson makes is as I think iconic as that. I I think for so I was nearly and still might go with the Thompson. And one thing I was trying to think of because most of these options that we're looking at here, they they look very unique. They have a unique oh yeah they're all cosmetic unique. to them. They're all unique. But it's like walking through an old neighborhood in an old city, and you're like every house looks unique. And then you walk through like a brand new neighborhood, and you're like every house looks the same. Right. That's that's a good analogy, Jim. So I was trying to think like chicken or the egg with the Thompson, right? It, is it its unique look that plays into kind of like people's maybe infatuation with it, or you know the uh, uh, the the nostalgia, or just its iconic nature, or was it just that's how it looked and where and how it was used during some certain periods of time? And then now we associate those two things together. Is that is any of that making sense? Oh, oh yeah, I'm following you. I'm trying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I was gonna go with that, but then also, ah, and I can't even put my finger on why. I think it's lightweight, it's compact, and goes bang real fast. And you can put it in your suit jacket, the Uzi. Nice. I'm. I don't wear suits a lot though. I'm really glad to hear you picked something that didn't have a Woodstock. Not because I, I'm against anything with a Woodstock, but coming from you, it, it to me, that's that's a sign that we're headed in the right direction. 1911s and wood. Jim hates both those oh things. Oh, my gosh. All right, never mind. No, it's the... It's... the it's it's Never mind. So, slippery slope. <laughs> slippery, yeah. Um, the other this one... This table hates it. So, the, gosh, the other one, uh, honorable mention, um, we didn't even really talk a lot about. You can build... Sub guns, not machine guns, but you can, you know, you can build a Sten. Yes. And some of these other, you know, grease gun looking, car muffler looking guns yes. yourself with some kits that you can find. Yes. How does that, where do you I go? Inter- do you I go interrupted you earlier also, Ryan, us, you know, joking around like, hey, stop, you know, cut. But what were you talking about? And maybe this is exactly what Jim's getting I at. got scared. I, I ran away. I don't even remember that part of the conversation. Well, you said in my garage right now or something to that nature. Oh, I no, can. we could, we could, we were talking about 10 millimeter. Uh, to Jim's point, you can put together many of these things if you're going to go the um, historical and interesting um, garage build type. The Sterling kits, the Sten kits, you can certainly do that. Uh, or you can go the modern type and go with like one of these AR pattern deals. We talked about Quarter Circle 10 earlier. They've got a large frame and a small frame that take Glock pattern magazines. Large frame can take the Glock 21 or the Glock 20 magazines. You can build it in 10 millimeter. Or if you really want to do something spicy, 9 by 25 Dylan. Mm. Yeah. Mm. What? Yeah, oh, oh yeah. nine by twenty-five, Dylan. That like, sounds like another interesting ten millimeter neck down to nine millimeter. That's a ten minute talk. Hold on tight. Oh man. Um, I also definitely think we should. Uh, we got to make a sten or something. Yes. Is the sten the one you go for if you make one? Uh, or Sterling? M- I think Sterlings are really cool too. Okay. Yeah. All right. One of those. Okay. Um. So that was a fun one, and. Uh, yeah, I th- I'd say that was like our last calls, for sure. I'm loving the I'm loving the vibe that we have going here. We're we're all uh, two weeks or so into quarantine now. Some of the uh, some of the <laughs> built up built up angst is now coming out. It's uh it's it's pretty fun. Next thing you know, two more weeks of this, and we're all just going to be screaming at each other the entire time. <laughs> we're just gonna. One podcast will be us just paintballing with each other to release our <laughs> frustrations. <laughs> uh, no, nothing like that. No, still, uh, still enjoy chatting with you guys. So, no, fantastic stuff. Thanks everybody for listening. As always, let us know what your favorite submachine gun is. We would love to know, and maybe it's one that's not even on this extensive list that Mark printed out. Uh, but anything like that. Also, your thoughts on the future of the nine millimeter. Um, and let it be known, I don't hate wood or 1911s. Just don't like them. 
<laughs> just yeah, not. A you fan. know what? Okay. Anyway, not... bye. <laughs> bye. See ya. Goodbye, everybody. All Thank right. you. <laughs> and did Kalishnikov also make the PPSH? Is he like Russia's John Moses Browning? Kind of. I don't think he did make the PPSH. But who did? Well, see, the PPSH, that I think was Finnish IP that was stolen. Because it looks just like the Swami. Yes. I think... Let's take a look here. Jim, you know a staggering amount about all these different firearms. Common Mostly nickname... I pretty much only like It's Papasha, yeah. meaning daddy. Uh, no, it was uh, designer by uh, Georgi Spagin. Hmm. Interesting. 1941. So it was before Mikhail Kalashnikov was doing his thing. Hmm. There you have it. There you I like folks. these things. These things I like. Mikhail Kalashnikov at, was born at, in 1919. Look at this ugly thing here. Vigilance Rifles, Inc. Oh, yeah, that's a cool thing. It's ugly. It is that's, ugly. It looks like a dramatic Which step one? rearward. Look, you go from you go from Magpul flashlight, suitcase gun, to sick AK-9, to then Scorpion, Vector, the SIG thing, suck fig. And then you go to this. <laughs> that's not that different It looks than like your survival. Do you still have your survival gun? Uh, yeah, I do. That thing didn't even... Shoot. Doesn't shoot straight. well. No, they're terrible. They suck. Yeah, but they're clever. I mean, yeah. Jim and I were talking about that, like taking survival guns, <laughs> surviving, and seeing if you could actually. You know what the survive? You know what? You know what the true survival gun is? Twelve gauge shotgun. The yes. M9. No, not the M9. Damn it. Uh, what's that one? The M12. No, M. Are you thinking of the M7? Seven. Yes. Yeah. That's a cool gun. There's one better. The break action survival rifle. That Isn't had. that what the M7 is? It's break action, right? Over, under, 410, 22. Are you thinking of the, the Henry the AR, AR7? No. Oh, are you no, talking no. about. Okay. Uh, I'm talking about the, the M7. It's, it's made out of metal. It was the one they gave to the pilots if they got shot down over some remote territory. Chiapa briefly made. It maybe still makes. A replica of it, but they used foam in the stock instead of the original, which used polymer or wood. The M6 Scout. Okay, the M6 Scout. Yes, that is cool. I should have bought one. That is a cool gun. Is that yeah. the one that you were thinking of? Yes. Aren't there some survival rifles that are there are 22 long? Mm-hmm. No, that, the, a, oh, that's what that is. is. The M6 is too. It's oh, a yeah. it's a 22 over 410, I think. Yeah. Oh, 22 Hornet over 410. Oh. You know, interestingly enough, you do talk about. I guess we're talking about like you know maybe the nine versus like a five five six or something like that, and mm -hmm. like you know carrying mags and ammo. You can get a lot done with the 410, and it is quite slender. You can mm -hmm. fit a lot in your pocket. You really want to do it upright, you buy Wild West Guns, Co-Pilot, mm -hmm. which is chambered in 457 Alaskan, which you can also chamber 4570, which you can also chamber 4510, or 410 in. Springfield made an M6 Scout for a little bit. Let's see if we could buy an M6 Scout these days. What, what one would go for? Ho! Oh! A lot of money. A thousand bucks. 22 long rifle over 410 gauge from Springfield. The modern edition. thousand bucks in the box. It was a $300 gun. Oh my gun. goodness, finally. What? Well, I've had this, uh, and I haven't been able to see it. Slipper? Well, yeah, it's a thorn from uh, Jim and Mai's uh, January trip. And it's just been bugging the heck out of me, and I think I'm finally going to be able to pull it out. I've got. I haven't seen. I haven't seen the thorn itself until today. I've got two in my fingertips from yesterday. I'm also reminiscing about a scar I have on the tip of my finger, when I was hurriedly loading in my college dorm room 30-06 ammunition to go on a mule deer hunt. 
I put my finger on the case mouth and I ran it up into the die and I doink. Oh man. I pulled it out and I went, oh. and I had to discard the case because there was blood in the case and contaminated my powder. Like and, super, oh, well, and if, well, if you watch Jarhead, you know that'll uh, jam your gun. Is that the one where he has to spit on the magazine and like spit wipe and the blood off? Yeah. I think it is. I think it's Jarhead. Yeah, that was a good movie. Yeah. Or those hurt. Except for that part. Is that it? No. Jarhead. Jake? Mm, no, it wasn't Jarhead either. No, Her damn locker. it. No. Wait, are you thinking of the one where they take locker. the, uh, I He's, think they take the 98 50 Bravo, cal? that one? Yeah. It was a 50 cal. One. And the guy's bleeding and there's blood on the bullet and he's so, like, it's jamming the gun. What were they doing? They, they were the shooting at some bad guy really far away in the building. I don't remember what movie it was. And they can see the glint off his tri uh, scope. That'll kill you every time. That's why you got to get them flash. flash Honeycombs. Things. Yes, sir. All right. That was a good one. Oh, that's all. I enjoyed that one, personally. Was, right, I you really guys were just... I was a innocent bystander. I was surprised to hear you say Uzi. I'm glad you said it, too. Why? I'm glad you said that. There's something about it. It's awesome. Uzi is awesome. Uzis are neat. I mean, like the Mac, like a Mac 10 versus an Uzi. It? What country is the Mac 10 out of? America. Something oh, okay. American. American. Something. The A is for America. All right. All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation podcast. Again, everybody, thanks and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.